So today we're going to talk about, everyone can see my screen? Thumbs up. Um, professor, yeah. quick question. Yes. Um, if I've missed like a couple of the assignments, is there a way we can like, um, you can reopen them or um, they can I still like submit them or um, I, I won't be able to? I, if there's a good reason, we'll talk during, let's talk during my office hours. Okay, all right, yeah. thank you. Or send me an email. I'm, if there's a good reason, of course, I'm always open to discussing. Thank you. I don't want to be yeah, penalized, but if there's, um, I, I have to stick to the deadline to be fair to everyone too. I see, okay, um, I'm gonna email you then. Thank you so much. No problem, and no, thanks for letting me know. Thank you. Oh, always a pleasure. Any other questions? Screen, everyone can see the screen okay? The presentation and the sheet? Yes. Okay, great. So today we're going to be talking about some, what I think is a really fun topic is how do we actually distinguish between direct and indirect expenses for departments? So let's, let's think about this. Let's say you have a company and it has multiple departments. What kind of company do we want to make today? Let's say we have a company that, anyone have an example of a company with multiple departments? Tesla. Yeah, Tesla is a great example. It's like awesome example. Like, what kind of departments would be in Tesla? It's like R and D, and then production, and uh, mm -hmm. stuff like that. Yeah, yeah. We have R and D, production. There's also different like business units itself, right? They sell cars, they sell solar panels, or they or they sell the batteries related to it and the technology. They license out the technology. Everything that either is an a department that's creating a cost, a department that's generating profit, or a department that's uh, making investments, all those different departments have strategic goals, right? There's an acquisition department for Tesla too. And so for the strategic goals, how do we measure the performance? Like we're one company, we have one big checkbook and we have the balance sheet that's presented on the 10K, you know, we have the 10K financial statements presented at the consolidated level. How do we actually make sure but if we have a factory where all these different departments lie, it's not like each department gets their own office, right? <laughs> we have a factory or we have a huge office structure. How do we make sure that all the costs that are shared get allocated to each department so we can measure their performance? Which is, that's a pretty in interesting question. Like how do we, and then how do we measure performance, right? Like how do we measure the accounting team's performance versus the sales team? Those are hugely different or the product team. Or how do, we de de uh, how do we determine the investment center, like the acquisition and M&A transactions? Each one of these has hugely different measures. And so what we try to do is we try to break these out into something called divisions, segments, or departments. We'll hear them, um, e all of these are synonymous. And so what we try to do is we try to decentralize the organization so we can have unit managers rather than uh, just one manager making all the decisions. This is normally when a company starts becoming more than 100 people. We start having to break into this. That's kind of the sweet spot. Um, so you'd imagine Tesla has tens of thousands of employees. You can't just have one person making all the decisions. You have to, you have, to have uh, all these different centers and then you have unit level managers overseeing this or an Intel or any of these Silicon Valley based companies. Okay, see question. So, yeah, good point. So question is, how do, we, how do we evaluate all this? The cost center, the profit center, and the investment center each have their own performance metrics, right? So cost center is normally evaluated on how much they're supporting the business and how, how well they're controlling costs. At the end of the day, they should be able to scale and control costs. Your sales team and pro product team should be evaluated in their success in generating income. So those are your two sides to any business, right? We, we make money and we spend money. We want to minimize how much we spend and maximize how much we make. And our investment should be evaluated on our, our like ROIs of our investments, right? Which is a combination of both. So today we're going to discuss how do we how do we evaluate performance? What are some of the metrics that we can determine? And so this is called responsibility accounting reports, also known as controllable costs. So it wouldn't be fair for a manager of a cost department to be penalized for something that they can't control because some things are outside of their department, but there are costs that the company incurs. And so what we try to prepare is a report based on the department of any costs that they control, and we try to allocate those costs to those departments. 
so that they get a fair performance evaluation. So a cost is controllable if a manager has a power to, to control it, that's pretty much to determine or at least significantly influence it. So a good example here is if you're a manager of a department, you can control supplies. So if a Tesla, if you're the manager of the product department, it might be how many, like your lunch budget for everybody. That's something you can control. How often do you take out your team? Or how, um, how much product they're using or like their prototype budget. That's something you probably control. You probably can't control the factory electricity, right? So that's a different concept of indirect from factory overhead concept. We're, we're making it a little different for controllable versus uncontrollable for responsibility accounting. Uncontrollable costs are things without, outside of the manager's control. One of the, the most blatant ones is your own salary, right? Like we're not gonna be able to control our own salary. Uh, that's something that we get paid. So that shouldn't be included in, in our evaluation. Although it might be influenced by our evaluation, if that makes sense. So uh, responsibility accounting system is really designed to provide information that helps an individual manager define its responsibilities and help that manager control what can be controlled. And so this slide, what we're trying to see here and what it's showing is every level of the business will have some kind of responsibility accounting. So for any large company, you're gonna have a board of directors, the president, and then you're gonna have your vice presidents and executive vice presidents. And then you're gonna get it based off region or your product areas. And then you're gonna have managers of each, uh, many managers within each region. And each one of these is going to have some kind of responsibility report because the person above them needs to be able to hold them accountable to the things that they can or cannot control. So for example, if you're the president, you might ask the executive vice president of the United States, can you show me your responsibility report? Can you show me your metrics and your budget? And then they will, they will show them how they're doing. But to get that, they're going to combine both the vice president's reports and so on and so, so forth. So it's very similar to the master budget, except we're now we're doing it at the departmental level and we're doing it for costs that we can actually control as it wouldn't be fair to penalize the, the vice president of the USA for costs incurred by Asia, especially if they're both in the same factory or department or warehouse or office. So responsibility accounting performance report. So really the amount of detail here is all judgmental. And I hope you're getting that takeaway from this class by now is that this is truly a judgmental field, managerial accounting, and it's gonna be based off of each uh, each business unit and each business type. So a department manager might receive detailed reports while the store manager might receive summarized information from each department. So if I'm working at a Walmart and I'm the manager of the Walmart, I might receive summarized information for the sports department and for the, uh, and for the home goods department while the home goods department itself is going to have a very detailed report. So as you funnel up, as you funnel up this chain, the reports are going to become more summarized because you, at a certain level, you can't read all the details. You have to trust your lower level managers to understand the details. So when you're hearing like middle management, when you hear this term, that's what they're talking about here is generally like your plant managers, your, um, your, or even maybe like low level vice presidents as that middle management. And then your executives kind of go up to the either vice president or executive vice president level. So this goes to the concept of direct versus indirect expenses. So this is, we've talked about this quite a bit in this class, talked about this concept quite a bit. And really here, we're trying to tie what are costs that can be directly traced to a department versus costs that can't? Because some costs jointly benefit two departments. So can anyone here give me an example of a direct expense? Like a cost of, uh, like COGS? Yeah, any cost That's of goods sold. Cost. Should, right. Most should be direct, right? Like your, like direct, your, Inventory product cost, I agree. Like rent? Rent is a, something, an example that might be an indirect cost. And it could be direct or indirect depending on where the department is. So let, let's say you have a, 
an office that is just the warehouse good office. That's a direct cost because we know everything in that office is related to the warehouse department. Um, but what if we have, an, most companies have an office that houses all the different departments. So then it would be an indirect cost, the rent for that office, because we don't know how much of that cost is associated to the warehouse department versus the sports goods and all that. Does that make sense? I uh, thank you. Yeah, same. The cost of land would actually be more of an indirect. It depending if you had one department on the land or if it was multiple departments. So here's a good example: is wages, rent, utilities, advertising, and depreciation all could be considered indirect expenses. The depreciation would related to a building or equipment if they are allocated to multiple departments and provide a joint benefit. So the, the key here is, can you trace the cost to one department or multiple departments? If you can trace it to one department, it's a direct expense. If you can't, it's an indirect expense. And so when it's an indirect expense, we need to allocate that indirect expense to the department. And so we're gonna use all of these concepts we, we've used before for allocation. We've talked a lot about allocations before. Really what we're gonna be taking is the total cost to allocate divided by, I mean, that's a, the denominator. The numerator is gonna be your percentage of allocation base used, and you're going to figure out your allocated cost. So allocated cost divided by your total cost to allocate is gonna equal your percentage of allocation base used. And so we're always going to determine how much cost is associated with the business and uh, the percentage associated with the business and multiply it by the total cost to allocate. The concept here is indirect and service department expenses are allocated across departments that benefit them. So we try to use cause effect relationships to allocate expenses. To summarize, if Jeremy runs the sports department and Christina runs the uh, runs the paint department. It wouldn't be fair of me to allocate Jeremy's space to Christina and then penalize her for it, right? And say, Christina, your costs, you, you have too many costs on your budget. And so we're gonna cut you, the amount of employees you can hire. That's not fair. So that's really what we're trying to conclude here is what's the cause effect relationship so we can be fair to everyone on the team. Any questions so far? Um, I have a question about, I, I mean, just theoretically speaking, in an actual business, if if somebody higher up has like a grudge against one of the department heads, they, they could kind of try to do that to force them to look bad, right? Yeah, yeah. That, well, that's why you tried, there's always a debate on your budget of you try to have a, you ha try to have a systematic objective approach to proving out why a certain allocation base makes sense. So this is like a very continued dialogue and part of being a manager of, you have to kind of protect your team. That's a way to think of it. Of if you are, if you want to secure your budget, you need to justify, well, why is it only fair that 20% of the warehouse's costs? And then you would put together a report or have your team put together a report justifying that. And if your manager has a grudge or something, then you have the evidence. And then it, you can, you know, that, that's always a way, but it's, of course, there's always gonna be politics in play, you're right. Now, I'm just curious, like theoretically, if you wanted to challenge somebody's allocation method, how would you do it? Yeah, you just as many facts as you can. So let's say you could, and, and that's what we're learning here is we would take the, let's say it's rent and you're saying it's unfair how much rent is being allocated to your portion of the business. You could go and say, hey, listen, I my, my part of the department only justifies 10% of the store. Is that, oh, no, we're only in 10% of the store, but you're giving me 20% costs. Why are you doing that? That's not fair. Because, and so there's your evidence, right? So that's how you challenge it. Ooh. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does. Okay, thank you, Professor. Oh, that's a great question. And so, yeah, a lot of these things are making sure if you're trying to make a, an assertion, we have to have some kind of evidence behind it. We have to justify it. It's a great question. Any other questions? Okay, so then the real risk here is allocating indirect expenses because like to Christina's point, which a great question is, 
for these subjective areas, these indirect expenses, how can we know it's fairly allocated to the departments? Well, we know that um, direct expenses are easy, right? We, we know how much paint in the paint department. We know that paint should go to the paint department, theoretically. But when it comes to rent, what do we do? Well, we need to allocate indirect expenses to the departments. So you're going to have to memorize here and learn like the common ways to allocate these expenses. So if we have a shared employee, so let's say there's you are manager and you have a team lead that oversees a few different departments, you will have to allocate the hours worked in each department to uh, to that employee's costs. So like, let's say it's 50 50, you're going to allocate them to multiple departments. Rent and utilities are generally done by square feet of space occupied. Advertising is done as by a percentage of sales. And depreciation is generally done by either the hours the asset is used or by how often the, the, the output of the asset itself. Service departments generally have, so a, the concept of a service department is uh, sometimes there's a department that solely exists to service the rest of the business. So everything in that department is shared with the rest of the business. This might be a like a customer service department, or it might be a, uh, a like a sale, like maybe general sales team, like they're used by everybody. So their office expenses, or even your accounting team, if you don't want to treat it as its own department, your accounting team should be allocated to everybody. So we might allocate office expenses by the number of employees in each department, personnel expenses by the um, number of employees in the department, or sales, purchasing costs by, you know, by an average allocation of departmental expenses, or maintenance, maintenance expense by square feet in the floor space occupied. So here's an example of how you do this. Let's, like, let's bring it down to practice. So I'll show you. So we have a jewelry store and we have a jan this janitorial service this is a good example of a like a service department. We have a janitorial service that comes in $800 a month and cleans the store. Now, the general manager, the top manager needs to determine how much of that cost is associated to each part of its de each department within the store. So we'll add here, this is kind of a simplified example department. We have the jewelry department, watch repair department, china and silver department. We're allocating based on square feet. That seems reasonable, right? Because it's a janitorial service. They're cleaning the amount of the they're cleaning the space. So it's our most reasonable estimate. Is it fair? I mean, maybe you can argue that it's harder to clean up the China and silver department than the watch repair department, but maybe you're splitting hairs at that point as well. Um, so then we're, this will be the information given to you. So we have two pieces of information given to us, $800 and the 4,000 square feet and the department met the departmental square feet. So then we'd have to figure out this next piece, the percentage. So we know the jewelry store is 60% of the store. The jewelry department, the watch department is 15%, and the China and silver department is 25%. And our check is if all of this equals 100%, it does. So we did our math correctly. So then total cost of the janitorial service is $800. So our allocated cost is just the percentage multiplied by the total cost. That's it. And our check is that the $800 equals $800 sold. So now what would we, what would we do? We monthly the janitorial costs, eight of the 800, 420 or 480 would go to the jewelry store. 120 would go to watch repair and 200 would go to China and silver. Does that make sense? Any questions, comments, concerns? 
Cool. Thumbs up are good. Check marks are good. I appreciate it. Cool. And we'll go to the next one. So then how do we make an income statement? And so ref refresher, we're just going to take these expenses and flow them into revenue expense and then get our income. So how do we do this? We get all of our revenues and direct expenses. We allocate indirect expenses. And then we allocate our service department expenses like the janitorial service. And then we prepare income statement. So what is this saying? We figure out our revenues. We apply the, by department. We apply our direct costs by department. We figure out our indirect costs by department. And then we prepare our departmental income statement. So it shouldn't be too far from what you would already understand. The only new step is we're adding in those indirect expenses. So let's do this example. So for the year, well, we'll say 2019, year end, we have our sales, our direct expenses. So some examples of direct expenses, cost of goods sold, salaries, depreciation on departmental specific equipment, supplies, and then indirect expenses. We'll have to figure out the allocation for is our rent, our utilities, advertising, our insurance. So we, we start with the total for the business. So the total for the business is we have one, four, seven, eight hundred. Do one, nine hundred on salaries, one thousand five hundred for depreciation, nine hundred for supplies. Everyone understands why these are direct expenses. It's because we can trace them directly to the business and our rent. These are things we have to figure out. Well, where does all these departments are in the same store? So how do we apply rent, utilities, our advertising, right? We just adding, we have maybe Google ads or a, a TV advertisement. Well, how do we apply that to the departments and our insurance? So add this up. Our total expenses are 220,000. Office, purchasing, repair, squares, appliances. I'm going through this example so you can see this will be what it's like on your homework and your quizzes. And then on your final, I'm going to go over this one specific point of this in a multiple choice format. And so then we also need to know service departments because these are shared by the operating departments. Our general office and our purchasing department are all used to help support the hardware, housewares, and appliance sales. Another thought is like these are cost, kind of cost centers. And then the other given information is our direct costs. So we know our oh, we know our sales, our cost centers, or also known as our support service departments. They make zero in sales. All our well, our hardware department makes one hundred nineteen thousand five hundred dollars in sales. Housewares is 71,700 and 47,800 for appliances. Does that make sense? Does anyone have a question why, why, we, why don't we have revenue for our service departments? Does anyone have a question regarding that? Does it make sense? Thumbs up? Makes sense. Okay, good, I'm glad. So the reason that we don't have sales in our service departments is because they're supporting the rest of the business. Like us accountants, we don't, unless we're an accounting firm and in an accounting firm, we don't generate revenue for a hardware business, right? Or a, a store. So that is getting all the costs related to these service departments are gonna have to be allocated to the operating departments. So in this example, our cost of goods sold, we're also going to have no cost of goods sold associated with our service departments. And then we're going to have 13, 
we're going to have these direct costs. They're going to be known costs. So these will be given to you because we can trace them directly to the department. So this might be like your accountant's salary, or it might be your uh, your purchasing manager's salary. The depreciation of the equipment. So maybe these are the laptops or computers associated with those employees, and then supplies, maybe paper, ink, coffee, paper, whatnot. Then our hardware, housewares, and appliances, we're going to have we're going to have cost of goods sold because these are uh, revenue generated businesses. So either cost of goods sold or cost of services. But we're selling products here. All these will be given to you because they're direct costs. So I'll add these in, and then you have this example for your homework. You all have access to this sheet. 400, 100, 200. And this is how I'd recommend you doing it for your homework and how you'd actually do it in you know, the real world as well. You'd use something like Google Sheets or Excel and then to, to generate this kind of budget. You'd probably just have some detail behind it. You might have a report that shows you this amount, this number. The rest, we don't know, right? And that's the problem. So, and that's why we're, we're learning in this class. It's judgmental. How do we apply these indirect expenses to and the service departments to all of the operating departments. What's a fair way to do that? And so we had in that previous slide how we would allocate, and that's what we see here. So we're seeing here, what we would add here is the allocation base. So I put insert here, allocation base. And so for indirect expenses, we'd have amount of value of space for rent, floor space for utilities, sales for advertising, percentage of sales, and value of insured assets for our insurance expense. So the 12,000, and then these allocations will all be given to you. So we're allocating this based off of this allocation all of these will be given as a percentage. And so this general office department, uh, purchasing department, all of these are a percentage of the 12,000. So you can see the 600, the 600, the 4860, the 3240, and the 2700 are all going to equal your 12,000. And so in the notes in this slide, uh, you'll be given that amount and the value of the space here is 5% for the general office you'll always be given that amount of information or they'll, they'll always have to give you a 5% or whatnot. Question is, how would you determine this in real life? And so open question for the class, like how, how would we go about determining that? We've asked it before, but I wanna make sure everyone's clicking. Remember, this is going to go towards your uh, participation grade. So it'd be great if there's students who no, normally don't participate. But You were asking um, how we allocate based on which department for floor space? No, the, my, my question here is, how do we determine the percentage? Like, how would that, how would that work for rent? How, did, how do we determine this 5%? Uh, by square feet. Exactly. Good, perfect. It's given, right? And so that square feet, we just measure the amount of floor space in used in the office for the general office. Great job. And so that's going to be given to you on your quiz and homework. So we don't, there's a lot of details here and I, we have to go through a lot more material today, but just know that that's how this five, this 600 is calculated is that 5%, right? So just take that 5%, the same is done for all of these other pieces, right? We just take the percentage of floor space or the amount and value of the space, all of these allocation bases here, they're going to give you a percentage to calculate, and then you're going to allocate these portions to that by that percentage to get these numbers. And so I'm going to draw the rest of the financial statements so we can see it here. So the floor space, if we allocate out the floor space, we have to get that 300, 300, 810, 540. And then a check, I would always recommend the great thing about accounting is you always have a check for your work. They should equal each other. So this equals 12,000, it equals the total costs. So your allocated costs always equal your total costs or your allocable costs. Uh, floor space here, that's oh, our 300, 300, 810, 540, 
and 450 and 450. And so your check here is do all these allocated costs equal your total costs? Yes, they do 2400. Do the rest sales. We have no sales associated 500, 300, 200. And entered assets will be 400, 200, 900, 600. And 400. Our check, does that equal 2,500? It does. And so again, all those percentages will be given to you. And then we can figure out our total expenses. But now we have an issue. Our issue is what are our total costs here? How do we allocate them to our operating departments? Because we have our service departments, right? These service departments themselves don't generate revenue. They support the operating departments, hardware, housewares, and appliances. So we have to allocate a portion of these costs to our operating departments. And so what we're saying here is I'll say total service department expenses. Sum it up. 15,300 and the 9,700, all these need to be allocated to each of the operating departments. Yes, Michelle, I see your hands raised. Any question? Um, yes, um, I just wanted to make sure that uh, for the four floor, uh, for the square feet, uh, do we need to um, like multiply the amount? Michelle, good, good question. That's this example up here we covered earlier. That's why I'm, we're not going to get um, over it again for the service department and operating department. At worst, the most you'll be asked for is you'll be given the department level of what, how much square feet is in the department for each department and your total square feet. That's the most I'm going to ask you in your quizzes and homework. So you might have to calculate the percentage using this first formula, but that, that's the extent. It's not, there's not going to be some you're not going to get any unknown variables, if that makes sense. OK. Does that make sense? Yeah. OK, awesome. Good question. That's how these two are tied together and why I did them in that order. OK. So now going back to the service departments, how do we take the service department's expenses and allocate it to our operating departments? Uh, the real, the way we're going to have to do it is, again, it'll be a percentage. And so that percentage will be given to you just like we did up here. Uh, so I'm going to skip the, the given percentage here. We'll get allocated 7650, 4590, and 3060. And that will be equal to our total 15,300. And then our other department will be 3880, 2630-3190. And so these, these kind of percentages are given to you. So the 40%, there'll be 40% theoretically allocated from the purchasing department to the hardware department. All those percentages will be given to you. So we add those costs. So in essence, then this, we have no income statement for the general office or purchasing. And ultimately we'll just get an income statement for the operating, uh, operating departments, the hardware, the hardware, and the appliances. And so how do we make income? What's the famous equation? I'll open it for the class. Should be a quick one. Sales, cost, profit. Yeah, revenue, our costs, and then we get our net income afterwards, right? Our, 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 it's really revenue, cost equal net profit, then net profit minus our expenses. But for this case, we're just gonna go revenue minus expenses equals our net income. Thank you, Mika. So how do we do it? Well, let's do net income. So from the total business perspective, we have our total sales up here. Oh. Well, I guess we'll just do, let's just do it by department. I'm gonna be easier and we can do the total business net income. We have our hardware, right? Minus, so that's our revenue. The sum of our expenses. So our total expenses here, hardware. The same one, our expenses. And that should equal 10,800 here. They didn't have the cost of goods sold associated with it. 
So 119, let's see how they're. General sales. Or is this their total expenses? Oh, total. This is the numbers their total expenses allocated. So I'm kind of skipping a step here. So total expenses allocated, just so you can follow along with the slides when you have this recording. Eighteen thousand eight hundred. I have the seven thousand here. This. This is where they're getting their numbers from here, or the, the slide is getting the numbers for 34,900. That's all the allocated expenses. So the direct expenses plus the indirect expenses other than cost of goods sold. Cost of goods sold isn't really an expense, it's an, a cost. So these are our, our allocated costs. Our cost of goods sold are also gonna tie to that to get our neck, neck income on the next slide. Any questions how these numbers were generated? Anything in this slide? I want to make sure if you come back to this, you understand this slide. So we went through all of this will be given to you, right? And all the percentages, and all you're doing is allocating out those percentages. If there's no questions, can I get thumbs up? Making sure. Um, sorry, Professor, I do have a question. Okay, good, good, good. So uh, in your experience, have you ever come across anyone using a method besides square footage to allocate rent expenses? Yeah, that's a great question. And yes, I, at the end of the day, this is all judgmental. And so all I'm trying to teach you here are ways to allocate, but you should use your professional judgment once you get into your business for your best allocation method. And that's something I would challenge you all to do, that we can always think of better ways. This might be an easy way is square footage, but there's good questions. like. Let's say we're allocating a janitorial, janitorial expense. Is it is square footage fair? Maybe if all the store has equal, like equal supplies. But what if there's a kids section, right? Like maybe the the kids section needs more than just square footage. Maybe you, maybe you do it by something different, like maybe the amount of inventory, or maybe you add a percentage to the kids section because you know kids might be making it extra messy, right? So use your judgment to make sure you have some kind of fair allocation while keeping in mind. Uh, at the end of the day, we don't want to over over assess like we always the, the accounting issue is making sure that whatever benefit we're providing we're not the cost doesn't exceed the benefit. Right, so we it's always good to come in with a questioning mind and um, but what i'm trying to teach you here is just ways to allocate, but then the next step is oh are there better ways, of course, there's always better ways and you can continue to explore them as you go into cost accounting and then if you really want to finish the journey, you can get your CMA you know your cost. Um, your cost or managerial accountant uh, certification. I'm sure your CPA will cover this too. It's one of the CPA exams. Does that make sense? Uh, yes, yeah, sir. Sorry. Thank you, Professor. No, my pleasure. Yeah. And the question? Yeah, sir. Um, I wanted to know is this like, is this actually a uh, practice in most businesses or is it is like a textbook example? Because, like, because like, I've done business management as well and like I realized a lot of it's like textbook and it's not uh, practical. So like, so would, would big businesses actually decide like uh, use square footing to allocate costs or is it just a very broad thing that some companies might do? Yeah, and so my question to you is like, what, what kind of, how big of the businesses have you managed or have you been in business? Oh, no, 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 um, like, like my dad's business, it's, it's, it's nothing, it's not like a, it's, it's, it's not very big, but. Um, there, I've, I've, there's a point, Saeed, and that's a great, it's a great question. This is used when you have multiple departments. So like I said at the beginning class, like if you have an, a, a company that's generally over 100 employees, oh. that's, kind of the, that's kind of the magic number. When you're under 100 employees, and it could be varying, right? But from what I've seen in my consulting practice, practice from working with, I've worked with companies that are 10 to 100 employees startups. And then yeah. I've worked with, you know, companies with 100,000 employees like while at my work at Google. And so under 100, you generally, you have a sense of the cost and you can, Manage and identify oh, the people. Yeah, it makes sense. But once we get to, let's say, you have a thousand employees, you need like this is definitely a standard practice. You might change the allocation base, but you need the the CEO needs some way to understand how yeah, exactly. the hardware department is operating. If that makes sense. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Yeah, this stuff is very applicable. That's the thing with accounting is we're not teaching some theory. This is all stuff you. It's all an applied science. 
And that's what, if you go to your, you know, if you go to uh, CSUN or, or uh, California State San Jose or anywhere else, it's actually, that's, it's an applied science degree that you get. It's not, um, oh, it's not wow. a theoretical science. Yeah. Good question. Thank you. No. Any other questions? Continue. This is excellent. Okay. Always happy to stop and talk through this. So now we figure out the income. Operating income or loss by department. So then we, how do we figure out the income? Someone else mentioned it earlier. We take the revenue minus cost of goods sold to get our net profit, our gross profit, minus our other expenses to get our operating income. So now we figure out here that we, our hardware is bringing in income of 10,800. Our housewares is bringing an income of 8,700 and our appliance department is losing money. Uh-oh, five, negative 500. And now we can figure out from our total business perspective, how much income does our business have? $19,000. Now, can we see why this is so important? We can see it's important because if we hadn't allocated out these service departments, then we would have had an appliance department that was profitable. So now we have a really big question. We Should we cut the appliance department? Like if the appliance department is losing money, should we even be selling appliances? And that's, that's what we're gonna talk about in the next chapter and why we're covering two chapters today, is do we cut departments when they're not profitable? And the question is it depends, or the answer is it depends. It depends on the shared costs, if we can also cut the allocated shared costs. If we can't, then we might want to still run the business because they're actually subsidizing a portion of the shared cost. And then from a management perspective, then you can maybe reward the hardware department. Looks like they're doing a good job. And then from Christina and um, Saeed's point, we might be able to challenge these allocation methods. So if I'm in the, the manager of the appliance department, I might want to challenge some of these. Say, hey, maybe, maybe this rent should be allocated on a different basis. Or maybe I don't think it's fair that some of the janitory, so much janitorial costs got allocated to me. And you think your department should be. So that all those discussions truly happen in practice at, at, um, at the management level. And that's probably what most middle managers to executives spend their time, a lot of their time doing other than strategy is like making sure they understand all of these so they're spending their money wisely. Any questions? Okay, excellent. Let's go back to this. So that goes to what I was just saying, this departmental contribution to overhead. So if we take our revenue minus our direct expenses, we get this, the departmental contribution margin. So we know we've talked about traditional income statement and we've talked about variable costing income statement. Under the variable costing, we understand our contribution to overhead and what we'll use this for is to determine if we should keep a department or cut them, which we're going to talk about in the next chapter in a lot more detail. Um, so the math here, so you can see if we do this on a variable, this was on a traditional gap income statement, even though we won't generally portray all our departments on a gap income statement, this is using a gap approach. What we can also do is to develop a contribution margin approach, which is our variable costing approach that we talked about in the earlier chap chapters. And what we do is we just take our revenues minus our direct costs. So from a, from a contribution margin approach, we see our appliance store is actually making quite a bit of contribution margin. So then the real question are, can we cut the indirect costs in order to make our appliances more profitable? The indirect costs are what are making our appliance department negative. So again, always take, I want to take a high level view of why this class is important. You should be able now to critically think and view, we just started with this level of information, right? This is all that's given to us. We know some costs, we know some revenue. And what we did now is based on all of this additional information we can find out from ourselves, we've added value to the business by saying, well, we know that direct costs, might appliance department might be profitable, but through indirect costs, it is actually 
not profitable. So either we need to cut the appliance department or we need to figure out our indirect costing allocations and figure out if we can make the appliance department more profitable. We wouldn't be able to do this unless we had learned this material. Right? That's the value add, what we're learning and why it's such a great job market for accountants. Yep, Mich Michelle, question? Um, yes, um, for, for if we cut, does it affect the other one, like the calculation or something? Exactly. That was the perfect question, Michelle, is will it? And that's what we will have to find out when we go over that in the next example. But that, that's going to be, if we cut the appliance department, will it actually lower the indirect expenses? And maybe it will, maybe it won't. That's something that we'd have to investigate. But that's the, the question we're trying to, we'll try to answer. I won't be asking that on a test or anything. It's just what I'm probing for you to dis discover when you uh, are actually out in the field yourself. Okay. Make sense? Yeah. Excellent, excellent question. Okay. Go back to the deck. And I know this is heavy, so we'll take a break in between. Uh, once we're done with this chapter, we'll take a 10 minute break in between. So stay with me and, until then. We'll, I think we got another 15 to 30 minutes of material to cover. And so we've talked about departmental overhead. So those were our revenue and cost centers. So I want to go back to the slide here. End of the day, beginning slide, we have our cost centers, which are also known as our service centers. We apply those to our profit centers, apply those costs to our profit centers in order to determine our departmental profitability. The cost center, what we might do here is go back to our cost centers and ask them why the indirect costs are so high. Um, and then our profit centers and ask them if they should be generating more revenue related to these costs. But that leaves the big question, what do we do with our investment centers? What is an investment center? I said at the beginning, I want to make sure we're all on the same page. What's, what's a good example of an investment center? Anyone in the class? I'll call if someone... Maybe Haley, do you know what a good, could you give me an example of an investment center? Uh, it's okay, just guess. You can just give a good guess. A bank? No, that's okay. That's a good thought, Haley. It's, okay. it's a very good thought. It's, if sometimes companies themselves have like a bank-like departments where the bank will make the, the, the that department will make decisions on if they want to invest in other businesses or not and normally these are called merger and acquisition departments and then also known as m and a merger and acquisition departments and so that's a good example of what an investment center would be yeah thanks see other ones research and development that might be an investment center. we might call that a cost center or an investment center depending on like the, the structuring of the business finance department also might be another one that also might be maybe a portion as the M and A might be a portion of the financing department, and then there might be another portion that's more of a service center. So these are all great examples. And then Michelle, did you have a question? I see your hand still up, or is it just from previous? Uh, no, it's just from the previous. Oh, okay, okay. Just want to make sure. I. No, 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 no worries. Okay. So how do we analyze these investment centers? It's totally different business. If I'm going to go buy another business, how do I determine if my investments are profitable? Not just profitable on a standalone basis, but how do I prove out that they're profitable to the whole company? Like I might be, if I buy a competitor, it might be a profitable competitor, but when I add it to my company, it actually eats into my own margins. So we have to use other performance measures. We've talked about some of them in other parts of our class, like return on investment. Our ROI, which is just what our, our return is based over our total costs. And we can figure that out from like a just a straight method or a discounted cash flow method where we have residual income, profit margin, and investment turnover. So let's go over um, all these calculations. And these are things mandatory for this class. You're going to have to know them. I've always said we're going to have to know all these kind of measures for the rest of your business and finance uh, uh, 
uh, education. And you're going to have to know it, even if you're not in business, if you're staying in business and you have to know it just for, for uh, if you're staying in business, but not going into finance or accounting, you still need to need to know these. They're important for like making a business plan. So let's go, I'll go over these different formulas. First, we have our return on investment for an investment center. So ROI is our investment center income. Um, divided by our investment center average invested assets. So if we have an we have an LCD phone and an S phone, our investment center is trying to compare the investments. So our LCD is five two six five hundred, and our average investment is. One thousand uh, two thousand two million five hundred thousand. Our ROI is going to be the diff the division of these two. These will be given to you in this class. In practice, you would have to actually go and get reports to show this information. And then, what about our phone? So, this is supposed to prove to you that just because an investment has more net income doesn't necessarily mean it's a better investment. That's the takeaway from here. Because even though LCD earns more net income, we actually have a higher ROI for our S phone because we had to invest less assets. And so that goes back to what I've always said to all of these since day one, like what matters more to a business, revenue or expense? I've always said you need to take into consideration both, right? Like I, I know tons of people who've started businesses and poured money into them and never made a drop of revenue, even though how exciting the business is. And then I've known people who have no expenses at all and generate great revenue. So you need to take both into consideration and like the difference between a service and a, and a cost-based business. Any questions on ROI? Okay, no questions. I know we've talked about it before. What about investment center return on uh, residual income? So residual income is the net income minus the target investment center net income. Net income, target investment. Um, equals our residual income. So this is also known as a discount rate. We've called, you're going to hear this a lot when we do net present value in future classes. You're going to ask like, what is your target investment return? What's your discount rate? Um, all of these, all of those different terms just mean one thing is you expect to make a certain return in the marketplace. Right? Like any business can invest in the S&P 500 and make a certain normalized return. That's about 8% right now. So why would they risk entering into a new marketplace or making an acquisition if it had a lower return than the marketplace or just a normal business? Like you can always figure out your weighted average cost of capital and figure out how much your business actually returns on a normal base, normalized basis. These are other things we're going to learn throughout future classes or you're going to learn in other classes. Um, why would we invest in something new if, why would we invest in something new if we didn't, uh, if we knew we could get a guaranteed 8% return somewhere else? Well, we wouldn't, right? Unless there's some strategic advantage and we're trying to like kill out a con cust uh, competitor or something like that. But generally that has, that's, that's pretty rare. We're going to look at this in isolation. We'd always want to beat out our return that we can generate either from the market or from our own business. And so that's what this residual income approach is doing is it's saying, well, well if we can get an 8% return, what's left over? And if the amount is positive, then we should invest in the business. And if it's negative, we shouldn't invest. So in this case, the investment in in income was already given to us. And then we, our target, our target investment center, I'm sorry, please copy this down. Is given to us here. Then our target is 8% of the investment. Our 
residual income here, LCD is oh, right. Let me switch it up on S phone four seventeen. Seventeen. Four seventeen should be getting. One zero eight. Okay, maybe it's in that one here. And that's where we're getting our residual incomes. So we in, in this fact, what we're saying is we have our net income, we have our target investment center, and then we are getting our residual income. And so the percentage of well, ultimately saying we could invest this 2.5 million anywhere else, right? So why are we investing in this division? Well, in this case, it's because it's providing a positive residual income. And then we can determine if we wanna invest more in the LCD versus the S fund. Does it make sense? Any questions? Thumbs up, thank you. Appreciate the thumbs up. Check marks, we'll keep going down. Awesome. So some of the last pieces, investment centers using profit margin and investment turnover. So now we can take this ROI and we can figure out our profit margin and our investment turnover, uh, uh, profit margin and investment turnover. This is also known as, uh, known as DuPont's equation. Um, it's a really big equation that we use throughout all of finance. It's kind of the, the cornerstone of most financial analysis. Saja, I know it's a lot. Don't worry, we're gonna take a break soon before we go to the next chapter. Uh, so ROI equals profit margin times investment turnover. What does this mean? It means that in essence, how valuable our business is, our return on investment is one part how profitable the business is. And then the second part, how quickly we sell inventory. Does that make sense? So there's really two business models. You can either have a low cost, high, I mean, a, a low cost, high turnover, or low margin, high turnover business, like Walmart, where you sell just a ton of products as quickly as possible. And you just get a very narrow margin. That's one way to get a high return on investment, have a high investment turnover and a low profit margin, or you can have a very high profit margin and then low investment turnover, which is made more like a, um, like a car company, or if you're a real estate company, right? You make big profits on these large purchases, but you, you sell them less frequently. Same return on investment for an investment center is the same way. So just memorize these formulas, the example here is we have sales income average invested assets networks, parks question here is do we invest more media networks or parks and resorts so we have the two three five one zero six nine zero two all this would be given to you and then i'd ask you to calculate your profit margin, your inv uh, investment turnover, and your return on investment. 415-3774-28884. Assets. And so how do we figure out your profit margin? profit margin is going to be your sales divide I mean your income divided by your sales 29.36 parks and resorts you get a 20.49 but your investment turnover it's the same calculation up here it's your investment center sales divided by your average investment 
So this has a higher turnover, your media networks. And then what's your return on investment? You just multiply the two out. Mine's a little more exactly round here. The other way you can calculate return on investment, right? Was your investment center income divided by your uh, average investment center? That's just done through the different algebra, right? So average investment, average income equals the, approximately the same thing. So two ways to calculate ROI, right? One way is to multiply your profit margin by your investment turnover. And the other way is to multiply your, or divide your income in, or your sales into your average invested assets or your income into your average invested assets. So you can use either way to calculate your ROI, or you can then back into some of these other aspects. So you might be able to know your ROI and your investment turnover, and then you can calculate your profit margin. So that's the called the DuPont formula. And that's, uh, you'll have to know all of these different aspects for your final and for your testing quizzes. Uh, so I had a quick question. Yeah. Um, you gave us two ROI formulas. One was investment center income over uh, average interest assets. Mm -hmm. And then this was the other one. So, um, so it's basically this, it would give us different answers, I'm assuming, right? No, um, they give you the same. That's, that's what this is trying to prove. Like this is a big proof in. Oh, so I could use either or. Whatever. Either or, exactly. So just okay. like with everything in accounting, the great thing is that you kind of have your checks and balances. Yeah. Right? And so here's a way that we prove out, like you can calculate return on investment either way, your preference, or you can use then if you have return on investment and in one of these other aspects, then you can calculate the missing one through right. missing variables. Thank you. And if you want to go even deeper, then you can probably calculate, like if you don't have investment center sales, but you have everything else, you can calculate investment center sales playing with algebra, right? Thank you. No, no problem. Good question. Okay, we're almost there. Stay with me, class. We're almost there. And then we'll take our break. I know it's heavy. Um, I'm going to stay out of the math for most of the rest. So what's I, I want you to just know the concept of balanced scorecard. And so we talk a lot about dollars and cents in this class, uh, which makes sense because we're it's an accounting class. But it's important to know that that's not the only thing that drives business. Right? It's an important metric and we need that. Like we've talked about from a pricing standpoint, you need that to keep the economy running. How can people make decisions unless you know how valuable those decisions are? But there's other aspects that we should use and quantify to measure the success of our company. We've talked about the financial aspect, but we should also talk about customer, like customer ratings, how happy customers are. Generally, we can indicate how happy customers are by how much they're buying, but we might also wanna check customer satisfaction we want to might, might check our like our internal processes, how happy our employees are, and like how little defects we're having in our products, and how quickly we're producing our products, and then our our innovation, learning, and employee satisf satisfaction. How much money are we spending on training, on employee development, on research and patents, and all that fun stuff? And so that's the concept of a balanced scorecard. And there's a lot of evolving theories on other ways we can measure business. There's actually an accounting theory coming out called ESG, where it's like, how do we quantify the cost savings of green investments? Like if a company becomes, reduces its carbon footprint, how do we quantify that? That's actually becoming a reporting requirement for top companies in the, soon, in the near future. Something that if you're interested in accounting, but you also are interested in green technology, man, that's going to be a killer field in a few years. So the guidance is going to be like, I got, I'm a revenue expert. That's going to be the next area of expertise where it's completely new and it's going to have a ton of regulation around it. So something, if you're interested in, we can talk about more. Um, major companies are making departments right now just to explore that. Transfer pricing. The, all I want you to understand from this concept, I'm not, I'm going to stay away from the math is, uh, what if a one department in a company sells to another department? Well, we have to quant, we still have to charge a cost to the other department because the first department, like the LCD department here, the TV department, deserves to make a margin on their product. But in theory, the company hasn't made a sale, right? We're just like selling, we're trading from one hand to the other. So we can't report that sale, 
but we still need some kind of metric to justify if LCD sells to this division, they still need to make some kind of profit from it. And that this division needs to incur some kind of cost or else it creates these unequal incentives within a company. Because then this department could buy all these, if we didn't have this, like S phone can buy all the LCD televisions for no cost and then sell them and have a huge influx of revenue. So we always associate some kind of cost and those costs are called transfer pricing. The transfer pricing is the cost we, we charge from one division to another. And normally that's like a standardized cost. It's not gonna be what we sell the marketplace. It's more gonna be some kind of cost plus market. Uh, cost plus some kind of adjustment. So we're saying here, S phone can purchase displays for $80 from other companies. So, and we're selling for $80 here. We're probably gonna sell it to the S phone division for $80, but we could sell it for less since our variable cost and everything else is a little less. That's all we're trying to get, get from is we shouldn't reduce prices in the departments unless, uh, because it's unfair to this first department. We also, one other takeaway there, we also don't want to be in a situation where we transfer product that we could sell to outside marketplaces, uh, the outside marketplace either for more money. So that's its own issue as well. So only time we would reduce our price is if we don't have an outside marketplace to purchase our product. Okay, cash conversion cycle. This is the last equation and then we'll take our break. Uh, cash conversion cycle. We are going to measure the average time it takes to convert cash from outflows and inflows from the customer. So how quickly do if we sell a product or from purchasing a product, how quickly does that then that product get converted into cash? So this might be helpful to understand a business that has a lot of debt. If they're using that debt to purchase their, their inventory, like a Walmart using accounts payable, um, how quickly will that inventory then become cash? We learned all these other metrics. And so just, you're gonna have to memorize the equation. So the equation is cash conversion cycle. will stay sales and accounts receivable. Days sales and inventory minus days sales and accounts. So what this is saying is our day sales and accounts receivable. How quickly does our accounts receivable become cash? Plus how quickly do our inventory become sales or our inventory become accounts receivable minus how often, how long it takes us to have our, us pay off our accounts with payable equals how quickly we receive, convert cash from accounts payable to cash itself. And then here's a reminder of all these other equations. So idea here is if our day sales and accounts receivable is 45, our day sales and inventory is 15, and it we try to pay our accounts payable within 30 days, our cash conversion cycle would be these two minus the accounts payable. So we, in theory, collect cash or convert an inventory into cash every 30 days. And here's all the different um, all the different formulas that we've covered before. You'll need to memorize these, right? We've talked, covered them before. I'll make sure you make, memorize them for the rest of your education. And here's the example of two different businesses. And so question is, or the one business over time, their cash conversion cycle increased over time. So we'd ask ourselves as managers, what's taking us longer? And we can then investigate here and find out that it turns out we're collecting our cash a little slower. So that's causing a problem. This appendix, we're not gonna cover. We don't need to cover. We've talked enough about cost allocations. And if, if you just wanna know a little more for yourself, you can dive into this to talk about how we might allocate costs on different bases. So it kind of investigates that question you had, Christina, a little further, but it's not mandatory. I'm gonna give this information to you for your quizzes and homework, just in case you more are more interested on all the different ways. You also cover this in a lot more detail in your cost accounting class and advanced accounting, if you 
to tend to follow it up. So that's it for this chapter. Any questions? Big quick recap, right? What did we talk about here? Really, we're talking about performance evaluation. We have three different centers, our cost center, our profit center, and our investment center. How do we figure out cost, uh, how to allocate and identify performance by a center? It's really, we want to only associate controllable costs to those centers or else it's not fair. It's really, how do we fairly identify what uh, department is responsible? And so then we went through and discussed, it's really this concept of responsibility accounting system where we take each department we talked about the department methods. Uh, we generally take a department at the most uh, disaggregated level, like a plant, or um, if we're talking about warehouses versus, if, if we're as a warehouse department store, maybe a paint department versus an athletics department. And then we they budget it out and we figure out how to allocate the direct expenses and in, in indirect expenses into controllable costs for each of those departments. We talked about allocate. Uh, we have to do that based on a common allocable base, which like are like the floor square foot, the square footage of each floor. And then we talked. We illustrated how that's done, and that's in that Google Sheets. Then we walk through based off of that how we are able to determine uh, if a department is profitable um, after allocating indirect costs, and by allocating cost centers to profit centers. And then by doing that, we also learned about the concept of departmental contribution margin and that departmental contribution margin can be taken to place to make sure that we uh, don't cut unnecessary departments and then um, and, and the value of looking at it from a variable costing and then a standard gap perspective. And then we also then talked about the investment centers and how we go back into our traditional investment uh, investment metrics and heuristics such as return on investment, residual income, profit margin, investment turnover. And we went over all the equations related to that in order to determine if an investment is valuable and how to compare one investment to another. We talked about non-finance based methods for determining success of a company, which include like customer satisfaction, internal processes and innovation based on the balance scorecard as well as transfer pricing. How do we make sure that pricing is fair from one department to another? And then ultimately how this, this one advanced equation on how we determine how cash um, can be converted. That's like that's really what I'm looking to take away in a two minute summary. Um, and those are the kind of questions, I can ask questions related to any of that on quizzes or homework or tests. Any questions before we go into our break? We'll do a 10 minute break after this. The next chapter isn't as complex, so it'll be a little lighter and a little more conceptual, less math heavy. <laughs>